Well, today we have a rainy day in Asheville, North Carolina. In this class, I'm going to review for you the important points for a final exam study for the entire course. And I'll do so within the time span of an hour. I hope you enjoy the review. We're going to review for the theoretical physics final. I'm going to go through the notes and point out important things. Let's start with chapter A. Here, you're going to want to know your Taylor series expansions, and we have seen, for example, e to the x, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial, plus x to the fifth over five factorial. Now I'm writing out several of these because I want to show you something with the expansion for sines and cosines. And we learn in the next chapter, B, you have the i theta, you get cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now look what happens here with these expansions. One plus, I'm gonna go ahead and expand this where x is i theta. You get an i theta here, and then when you square the i, you get a negative sign. And I'll leave that to factorial there. And then here, if you cube the i, you then get minus i. So, theta cubed over three factorial. And then here, if you go to the fourth power, you'll get a plus. And then for the fifth, if you multiply by i again, you'll pick up an i here. That's the easy way to say it. Hit this with an i, minus one. Hit that with an i, minus i. Hit that with an i, plus one. Hit that with an i, and then this one. So here, in the cosine is the even function. So the expansion for the cosine would be one. Then you skip the odd one. And we go to the next one. See how we can do this? And dot, dot, dot. And then for the sine, we're going to whatever multiplies the i, so it's theta. Over here, it's a minus theta cubed over three factorial, and then plus theta to the fifth, five factorial. So you see, you can, you can get that. You have to memorize all that. You can, you can get it, and it helps to review a lot of good stuff that we looked at earlier in our course. Let's look at this rotation matrix. Cosine theta sine theta minus sine cosine and let's derive one of the trigonometric identities so here we're going to look at an angle alpha and an angle beta This is the result of doing one angle, the rotating alpha and then beta. That's like rotating one angle alpha plus beta. And this upper component is given by cosine alpha times cosine beta, and then the sine hits that sine with the minus sign. And there's something going to be here, there's going to be something there and there, but the main thing here is that this is the identity. You can find the sine one by looking at this component here, which should be cosine sine and sine 
cosine with the various angles. Then for groups, a lot of stuff in this first one. For the group, consists of elements A, B, C. You have a binary operation that satisfies four conditions. One, closure A times B is an element in the group. Two, association, that if you apply the first two and then the third, that's the same as doing the last two first. And then identity. And finally, inverse. The properties of a group. That pretty much wraps it up for the first class. And part of the second. So in the second class, we looked at the derivative of e to the x being the same. And we have that up here. Now if you take a derivative, the one goes away, you get a one here and two comes down, you get the x. You get the, the left uh, adjacent terms as you take derivatives. And here is where we have that nice relationship with Euler. E to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now, combining the previous class with this class, we saw that multiplying by i is a rotation. So let's go ahead and review that. This is part of the first class when we did the groups with the, the marching or the soldiers. So here we have here you have i, here you have minus one, here you have minus i, that's your x, this is your i, y. This is your complex z plane, which we look at later in the course. So if you multiply one by i, you're up here, 90 degrees, counterclockwise. So if you had a theta here, where this applies, and you multiply by i, you come over to here. So if this is z, say this is z, e z i theta, then i z is 90 degrees over. Now this is very, very nice stuff that we can look at uh, later. For example, if we deal with poles and we have to deal with i a lot, it's nice to know that, for example, if you were to go 90, you multiply by i, but if you were to go 45, you'd multiply by the square root of i, see? Square root of i, square root of i times square root of i, is i. And that would be square root of 2 over 2 plus i square root of 2 over 2. It's a very, very nice result. And you really know that already from here, because if you look at i, that would be e to the i pi over 2, see? And that would get you, get you i. So if you took the square root of this, that would be like coming up here and saying i over pi, times pi over 4, see? And pi over 4 is your 45 degree angle. So, so really this is embedded in there. And then you could do the cube root of i would be going up by 30 degrees. See, very nice. So if I take the cube root of i, that would correspond to a 30 degree angle. 30, 30, 30 gets me 90. So that's very nice to know. Then for the integration tricks, the two that come up a lot in the course would be the derivative trick and the real imaginary trick. So when you have the real imaginary trick, like when you're working with cosines and sides, it's, easy, sides, it's easier to integrate this e to the i theta rather than that. So you want to know uh, that real imaginary trick. So that would be, for example, if I went from, say, zero to infinity, a v to the minus ax, here's a, one example, and I wanted to do cosine, say, of some kx dx, 
it's easier to do both. In other words, re replace the cosine and sine with e to the i k x using the Euler relation, and the i set keeps it separate, the sine from the cosine. So you want to know that trick, and you want to know your derivative trick comes up a lot. For example, here we went from minus infinity to plus infinity, minus a x squared the x, and I would remember this one, square root of pi over a. And then by taking derivatives with respect to a, you pull down x squared. So that's very important to know. And you might ask, for example, if you were going to integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity, you had x squared, and you had no a, well, you put one in. And then you take a derivative, because you can't, you can't do it here without the a. So put the a in, take the derivative, and set a equal to 1 when you're finished, and you'll get back this. So that takes care of the first two chapters. So if we go on here to chapter C, I would say for the relativity chapter, you, you should know the Lorentz contraction and the time dilation. We, we looked at that more than once. So here, this is Lorentz contraction. So you're in some lab, this is lab, that's us, or watching someone go by in a moving frame. And from our perspective, there's the contraction. And then as we in the lab watch a clock go by in, in that moving frame, we have the time stretch, dilation, time dilation. So you, you wanna know, you wanna know those two. And this is a nice little diagram here. We've, we've seen more than once. If you have a right angle here, and this is MC squared, and this is PC, this is your nice relationship, gets you your energy in special relativity. That E squared is M squared C to the fourth plus P squared C squared. That's, that's a good one to know. And that angle relates to the speed. There is a source of possible confusion with the relativity triangle on something that we did later in our course. Here in the earlier chapter, we had mc squared, pc, and the energy. Now notice that if the theta is zero, you're at rest, and all of your energy is mc squared. But if you're moving, you have then the combination of the energy at rest plus the momentum and you use Pythagorean theorem. However, you could always write E equals MC squared. So what we're gonna do now is put a knot there, which emphasize that this is the rest mass when you're at rest. And in general, you can write E equals MC squared. And that's important because for light, for light, we have a 90 degree angle so that the energy is all PC. So for a light, the rest mass is zero. For a light, you have E is PC. And then for a light, you also have HF. And later in the course, we then said the energy has an effective mass times the speed of light squared. And this is the effective mass. This is not the rest mass. For light, the rest mass would be, for a light, m naught is zero. The rest mass is zero. However, the effective mass given by the general energy equation, e equals mc squared, is not zero. Now we're going to relate the rotation matrix to special relativity. And this will illustrate another power of the rotation matrix. So having two coordinate systems, an X and a Y, X prime and Y prime, if we look at a line from the origin to point A, we can see that this length is given by X squared plus Y squared 
in the original frame, but also can be obtained by coordinates in the prime frame, x prime squared plus y prime squared. These are the same, because the length, the length from O to A is gonna be the same. Now in relativity, we see this come up a lot, that this is what's constant or invariant instead of the x squared plus y squared. And the Minkowski trick is to make the I C T be equal to Y. And then when you square the X, you get your X squared. When you square this one, your Y squared, you get minus C squared T squared. So that's the constraint for relativity. And when we apply the transformation, X prime, Y prime over here equals cosine theta, sine theta, minus the sine theta, cosine theta, x and y. This tells us how to get the new ones in terms of the old ones. So x prime is cosine times x plus the sine times the y. You turn that vertically and hit the, the pairs. Come out like this. Then with relativity, see if we have your K-frame and then your moving frame for velocity V, we would like you to remain at rest in your frame, the prime frame. That means this has to be zero. And then I'm gonna look at you in my lab frame, watching you change distance, and you're gonna have a change in the the time, because see, this is IC delta T, and this is zero. So that means that delta X over delta T is going to be the IC delta T sine theta over cosine theta. So your IC delta T with the minus sign. We're gonna put this on the other side of the equation. So we'll have minus IC delta T times the sine divided by cosine. And this is the velocity V. So that means the tangent of theta would be equal to V over the minus IC and multiplying top and bottom by i, we would get i v over c. We then mark ourselves a little triangle, i v over c one, this would be your tangent. And we proceed, not worrying that an imaginary number has shown up. Remember Feynman dealing with imaginary numbers and integrals same thing applies here, same principle. So that means the hypotenuse would be one squared. And if you add this squared, you get the famous minus V squared over C squared. And then when you plug these in, uh, say here for your, your cosine, your cosine here is one over the square, famous square root and the sine is going to be I V over C over the famous square root. Then when you plug those in here, you get the Lorentz transformation. So really the Lorentz transformation can be arrived at fairly, fairly easily and this way. You can do it on the back of a napkin in the cafeteria for your friend. For class D, where we're looking at the E and M, I would say basically skip D. And then if we go to E, which deals with divergence and Stokes theorems, these are good theorems to know. So here is the divergence theorem. So if you have E dot DA over a surface, this is a closed surface, 
That's a volume integral if you take del dot e integrated over the volume. Sometimes we use tau or you can use v. Uh, that one's good to know. And then Stokes' theorem is a nice one to know also. And that is if you do a integral closed path here, that this can be replaced by taking del dot v dot dA. So this is, you're going a dimension up. You're going from line to area. And here you're going from surface area to volume. So this looks good there. Okay, then I would not remember anything about the electromagnetic theory stuff. This is just the basic theoretical uh, mathematical physics stuff that's very, very important. And then to know the gradient and how to apply it in these cases. So the gradient, the divergence, and the curl all come from thinking of this operator, the del operator, J, and here. Okay, so when you have a scalar function, say of x, y, and z, by applying this to that, you get yourself a vector, and that is the gradient. Then if you apply this as a dot with a vector, you then get the respective derivatives of each component of the vector, and this is a scalar. In other words, we no longer have a vector. And then if we do the here, your curl like this, remember this is what we looked at in terms of a determinant to help us remember the partials here, three of them, and then AX, AY, and AZ. And for the first one here, you would just mark off that and it'll be the partial derivative of a z with respect to y minus the derivative of a y with respect to z. So that would be how you would work that out. That's good enough for E. Then if we move on to F, F dealt with the wave equation. It's nice to know the wave equation and it's not that hard to remember. If we have, this is now considered Laplacian, where you have del dot del, and that would be the second derivatives as an operator. And if that works on a function, the wave equation is simply gonna be, and you could get this by dimensions, if we have here the time to get, to get one over a meter squared, you would need to have a velocity here. So, so you can you can get that from basically thinking of dimensions. I would remember nothing about the ENN stuff in that chapter, just this basic thing, and also the idea that if you have a function f of x and x, that if you want to shift that function down a distance d, then you would go f of x minus d. This new function, say g of x, would be the first function shift that we use that trick in the course. So that's pretty much it for that chapter. And don't need to worry about different wavelengths of light. That's an optics course. And then we go over to g, which deals with the ideal gas law. So it was good to know the ideal gas law. And this is also the number of particles times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature absolute scale and the temperature. Don't need to worry about anything on deriving the ideal gas law. I think here, what would be more important are your four dynamic processes. If you have isometric, no change in volume, then your work, which is PDV, it's going to be zero. If you have isobaric, where the pressure doesn't change, then if you do 
this you get the nice result p is a constant so you get v2 minus v v1 and isothermal uh, that would be for the work you would have the pdv but the ideal gas law is telling you that's nr t over v and since the T is constant, no change. Uh, you can pull that out, NRT, and you would get then the logarithm of V, say, from 1 to 2. And then you would have NRT log of that ratio. And then the last one was adiabatic, where the no heat transfer. It, it's not bad to remember the formula, but not the derivation. And the gamma is the ratio of your specific heats, Cp over Cv, and that's, that's nice to know. Uh, also here I would say the total energy, ideal gas, three halves nRT, or three halves nKT, is good basic stuff to know. And for your specific heats, remember we had also the delta U is the heat that goes in minus the work that's done. And like this, where this is your P delta V. And if you have a case where there's no change in volume, then delta U, the volume constant, delta Q, say no change in volume. And that would get you a 3 halves nr delta t. And the specific heat constant volume is basically to look at how your, your heat and temperature uh, changes. So you're basically comparing the amount of heat compared to the change in temperature and scale down, divide by the number of moles. So it's fair. And that gets you the famous uh, three halves R. And I wouldn't worry about the pressure one. I would say that's, that's good enough. Probably should look at one more thing. And that is, you should know your way around the engine cycles. So if you have something like, like this, you know, where you're going this way up there and that way. Remember we, we did that know how to do problems like that. You are basically using your work definitions that we gave earlier and see. So that's nice to calculate efficiency is the work enclosed, the work that you do, divided by the heat that goes in. So you wanna be able to do problems like that. For class H, the main thing you need to know there, you don't need to worry about all those derivations, but a connection between entropy, the macroscopic system, entropy, and the microscopic system, where W, the number of ways that you can do things, that is very, very good to know. And then you should know here the idea of the energy levels and calculating the partition function. So if if you look at that, say you have energy levels, you know, one, two, up to epsilon, and there's a number of particles that are in each of those energy levels. We said, first of all, you calculate partition function, which is to do a sum of E to the minus the energy level divided by KT. And then you sum over those, that gets you at your Z. Then for the number of particles in a state, you would take E to the minus, say, EI, that case, and divide by the, the, total, the total sum. So that's good to know this. Here, you also, are, you're really figuring out NI divided by the total number. So this is giving you the fraction. So Ni, the number of particles in the ice state, divided by capital N, all your particles, is given by this formula. And then know how to do problems like that. So that takes care of that chapter.
And then when we go to chapter class I on quantum mechanics, I'd say here know your, your cute formulas. Uh, for example, if we go back to relativity, and this is PC, MC squared and E, for light, uh, the rest mass for light is zero, and you can think of this as being a triangle that just went 90 degrees, so that E is all PC. So you want, you want to know that. And then also here for light, your C is the wavelength times the frequency. So we want to know that. And then you also want to know that this is H times uh, the frequency. So when you put all this together, when you get P lambda F is HF, that's saying that P times lambda is H. And this is cool because this is the De Broglie relation that when you apply that to matter and say that the wavelength, H divided by the momentum, just giving you the two forms of the same expression. This is true for light. And then De Broglie says it's also true for matter. There's matter waves. So you want to know that. You also want to know that the K wave numbers 2 pi over lambda, these are things you've encountered in other courses, and omega 2 pi times the frequency. So feel comfortable with that. And also your period, the period is 1 over the frequency. The frequency is 1 over the period. Some basic, basic rules there. And we have seen those appear again in the course. I think that we're good for that chapter. I think that's good enough. And then we come here to J, where J deals with spinners. So here you want to know the way matrices have some definitions. You have A, B, C, and D, say, for example. You want to know that the trace, you add A and D. You want to know that the transpose is a switch B and C. You're, you're exchanging, you know, if you write down, this is a matrix in general, IJ, uh, the trace would be to take the IIs, you know, the ones that are on, on the diagonal, just, you know, sum them all up. The transpose would be to switch to J and the I. Right. Complex conjugate, you would uh, then simply take the a, I, J, and put a star on there. That's the complex conjugate. So if you have an A plus B, I, then you're going to go A minus B, I. All right, complex conjugate. Hermitian conjugate would be, and that's the A with the dagger. This is saying take the transpose and then go ahead and take the, the conjugate, the complex conjugate. For the inverse, I'd say don't worry about that. And then for the unitary, nah, I don't think so. I think we'll skip over that. Oh, the determinant. Yeah, know how to do the determinant of a two by two would be A times D minus C times B. So these definitions you are familiar with. The main thing here would be to to know how to find eigenvalues. Now, the Pauli matrices, I would say, I don't need to memorize those, but let me just write them down for you. 0, 1, 1, 0. And then the Y1, 0 minus I, I, 0. And then the Z1, 1, 0, 0, negative 1 like that. So you want to know here also the definition of your chronica delta. You want to know the chronica delta. So that would be zero if i is not equal to j, and if it i equals j, it's one. And the Levi Civita symbol, where here this is one if these are in a cyclic relation, like one, two, three, three, one, two, two, three, one. And if any are interchanged, it's the negative. 
and if any two are equal to zero. So you wanna know that. And then the eigenvalue problem, how to find eigenvalues. So if you had a matrix like A that we had up here, and then we hit that with a vector, and then we get the same vector back with some value. This is the eigen value, and that's the eigen vector. So you wanna know how to do these kind of problems that we did in our class, All right? And also to normalize. So if you get, for example, a vector like one, one, uh, that would be normalized by taking the square root of, like that. You square this one and add the square of that one. Or technically, if it's imaginary, you would take complex conjugate. In other words, if this is a C1, you would take C1 star, star it's a complex conjugate and add that to C2, and that would be one. All right, for the Pulley equation, I would say, don't worry about that. And it's nice to know that in quantum mechanics, if you have the Hamiltonian, that's basically, you know, writing out in the Schrodinger equation, you would have this. You get energy as the eigen, value and you get then the state back for the eigenfunctions. So you want to, to do that. I'd say all the stuff with the cross products and stuff with the angular momentum is not really necessary since that's uh, going to be covered in your quantum mechanics course. And I would say don't worry about the rest of that. You should know, though, your your coordinates, that if you're going from Cartesian to, to the spherical coordinates, where if you have x, say z, say x here, rather, and y there, x, y, and z, like that, then if you're going to go to looking at, say, here's phi, and this is theta, you want to know that x would be uh, the cosine of phi times this thing. And if this is r, then this down here is gonna be r times the sine of theta. So you're gonna look at here r sine of theta cosine of phi, and this is r sine of theta sine of phi. And then your z is R cosine of theta. So if we move on, all right, so there you could also look at R squared as being the sum of the squares of the coordinates, Cartesian coordinates. And you could also look at that here, if you were gonna look at the tangent of phi, that would be your y over x and your cosine of theta is z over r. So here we have equations that have x, y, and z on the left and then the spherical coordinates on the right and here you have the reverse. So you can, you can go both ways. You wanna take arc tangent or r cosine to get back here, take the square root. And when we go to Excuse me. When we go to L, the Dirac equation, I would say we can skip skip all of that. When we go to M, you do want to understand how to work with solving a differential equation using power series. So if we have a power series here like that, you want to be able to take the derivative with respect to x, and the second derivative, and then you know plug it in some equation, like here's just one we did in class, the Legendre one. And by plugging that in and solving, you can get then the coefficients a sub k, get a recursion relation. So you wanna know how to do problems like that. So it's good to go over, to go over that technique. For the Dirac delta function, I would say know your properties that this is a class and for the Dirac delta function you're looking at 
let's say delta x is going to be infinity, infinity or zero. So it's zero if x is not equal to zero, and if x is equal to zero at infinity, and we have an understanding of that as a limit of Gaussians as they get more and more peaking, the probability distribution. But you need not memorize details about that statistics. You can also skip the stuff in that chapter except for nice result that if you're integrating with the delta function, here's some function of x, that this is a sifting property. It pulls out the f of zero. And if you have, let's say we're going over everything, all right? And then if you have delta, uh, say x minus a, f of x dx, that moves that spike over to the point where a is, and that would just pull out the f of a. So that's good enough. I think that takes care of that chapter. And O is the Fourier series. So yeah, you should know the general idea here that the series has a constant term, and then you're gonna sum up here from n equals one to infinity, a sub n cosine of, uh, let's say, in x, all right, plus bn sine of x, like that. And then, uh, after you have that set up like that, you want to be able to write down what your constants are, that a naught is simply integrating. And here, uh, for these Fourier series, uh, we have standardized in our class to go from uh, minus pi to plus pi uh, and have periodic functions. So if you had, say, a square wave like in there, it would just repeat. So using that convention, we go from minus pi to plus pi, and this is just to integrate the f of x over that interval. Then for the a n, these other cases, uh, there's also a one over pi in front. So you're dividing this by pi, so one over pi. All the equations have one over pi, that's why you put that two in there. This would be minus pi to plus pi, and this is the cosine of n x times f of x dx. And then the b, 1 over pi, minus pi to plus pi. This is the sine of an x, f of x dx. So these are not hard to remember, those formulas. And you want to know how to do some problems like that, so like the square wave and, and different things that we did. Then we go to class P, which is the Fourier transform, and you do want to remember the final result of that class. You don't have to know the derivation or anything, but you do want to know that if you look at, say, a function, f of x, that if you want to take the Fourier transform to get capital F of k, you would do the one over square root of two pi. That's the convention we're using to put that in there like that at the beginning. And you would integrate f of x, e to the minus i k x, and then you would integrate here over all the x. And then go the other way to get f of x, little f of x, 1 over square root of 2 pi, integrate, and this is going to be the one with the plus sign, every every k. So if you want, to, you want to remember this one first, say we're expressing a function in terms of coefficients, this is a generalization of the Fourier series, then that can help you understand that that's a plus sign there. Then if you want to get what these are, which is the Fourier transform, that's what the minus sign. So there are the conventions we use, and this little symbol here means take the Fourier transform of f of x would mean to do that thing up there. And then the symbol with the minus one would be to take the inverse Fourier transform uh, here to go back to get the f of x.
and you want to know how to do some of those. Then we move over to class Q, and that's the Laplace transform. So for the Laplace transform of a function, and here we often uh, just go ahead and use T as the variable. So function, say F of T, like that, you would integrate from zero to infinity, uh, F of T E to the minus ST, D, T, and you would then get what we will call capital F of S. So you wanna know how to do those, and here's where that cosine and sine came into play with the imaginary trick in doing that. Also, the derivative trick came into play where we built up our table. So it, it'd be nice to review that. Can you derive that table by doing those uh, simple integrals and using our tricks? Helps review the earlier chapter uh, B, which dealt with the integration tricks. Then if you're going to do the Laplace transform of a derivative here, say of t, it's going to be s times the Laplace transform of the function without the derivative, and then minus the function before you did the Laplace transform at t equal to zero. So if you know that, you could generalize to the Laplace transform of the second derivative. And it's not a bad idea to, to just go ahead and do that. That would be then S squared of the Laplace transform of the original function at minus S F naught minus F prime. So it's good if, if you look at this a trick we did in class, we said uh, let say sum g of t be the first derivative and then apply this basically twice is what you're doing. And then you wind up getting this. So it's nice to be able to do that. And then you used this trick in solving differential equations. And the, the one that we looked at a lot was the number of particles left in a radioactive decay heap. And here, uh, we played with that, and then at some point we added a dumping function. And here you can take the Laplace transform, you go to transform space, solve the algebraic equation, and then go to the tables to look things up. So you'll be given uh, some of the table results, or you might be asked to derive some of those results since over earlier you can do that using the integration tricks. Then we go to the convolution, all right, R, and what you want to remember from this uh, class is not all those derivations and stuff. You just want the result. You just want to know what is a convolution. If I take f of t and have the convolution with g of t, that what I'm going to do is integrate from 0 to t and take that f and make it uh, going to be f of u and then take that g and make that t minus u and integrate over u. So that's basically what you want to remember from that whole chapter. And then know how to do something. So if, if f of t is 1, g of t is t, work it out. And notice that since there is a commutation rule here that applies, if it's easier to put the function in a different order, do so. For example, if this f was an easy function like just t, and this one were more complicated like a t cubed, I wouldn't want to do the t minus u cubed. I'd rather have the cubed one here and then just do the t minus u there. So you can note that trick. Now we go to S, that Cauchy integral formula, and I would say there, Green's theorem, I have, don't worry about that, since you, you, you have the more general case uh, covered uh, with the Stokes theorem, so so we're in good shape there. Uh, he, here you're basically wanting to know the result that if you do a counterclockwise contour integral with some well-behaved function divided by something that has a singularity or a pole, that this is 
2 pi i times f of a. That's the only thing you really need to know from chapter S, and the next chapter we apply it. So we go to chapter T, and here we're going to apply this, this rule. So if we had some capital F of Z, which the capital F now includes some poles, then what you do is, when you're doing this integral, the way you apply this, you really want to go from minus infinity to plus infinity, but you consider going from minus R to plus R, and then like this in the complex plane. And if you have poles up here, you then have to deal with those. Never worry about proving that this contribution goes to zero. If if you apply this, just go ahead and apply the rule. So if you have, say, minus infinity to plus infinity of some dx, like x squared, you know, plus one, what is that? Just make them z's, find, find the poles, and then apply this principle that this is going to be 2 pi i, uh, sum the residues here, the residues of f, and that's going to be uh, where the poles are. So I'm going to put down here and say z sub i. So the z sub i would be i is the index. It's uh, telling you where the poles are. Since there's an I there, why don't we just make that index an N so that there's only one I and that I is the square root of minus one. All right, so here, this is, this is what you need, this generalization and how to apply it. So here, in this case, I would have X squared equals minus one. So X would be plus or minus I. So in that case, I would have an I here and an I down there. And when I do my integral like this and close up here, I would just worry about that top one and doing the residue. Remember when you do the residue, what you do is you clear the singularity. So if this were, if this were my F of Z, I would first take the Z minus A, clear it, and then I would put in the I for the, when I have the result. When you have multiple poles, you would clear each one individually and then put the values in. So you wanna know how to do that. And in terms of closing, above or below, it wouldn't matter here. But if you ever have an integral to deal with and you have an e to the i, say something here like a, a kx up, up here, this requires you to close upward because upward, when you go up that imaginary axis, then when this becomes a z, this z will be i times that radius, you know, when you go up. And that has to get you a negative with that r so that when r goes infinity, it's zero. So if you ever had a minus sign there, then you would want to close down below. So e to the minus i k x if i close below then down here z is minus i r and then minus cancels minus and i squared is a negative so that's the only subtlety that you might run across in terms of where to close above or below all right and we go to green's functions class a u and for Green's functions, well, this is the Green's function uh, that we did earlier. The Green's function uh, can be thought of as the impulse uh, result you get. And before when we had this G of T minus U, that's what the Green's function is. And then you set up your convolution where you have, I'm gonna put the Green's function first here the impulse result, and then this would be like your dumping function or, or something going on. And this here, we go from zero to T, we're integrating over, over the past, uh, the T primes refer to the past. So that Green's function comes in handy when you are looking at, say, a differential equation. And when we did the differential equation, uh, we said that this Green's function is the result of, of an impulse. 
So that means when you have like a dumping function or something you're putting in there, you want a delta function. That's your impulse. Solve for that, get the Green's function, and then when this is some arbitrary uh, function of dumping or some, in, let's say, think of it as a sum of impulses uh, with that, break that function down into like bit by bit impulses, and then with the Green's function, you get you get everything. So that's the main thing for that class. And then when we looked at here, the Fourier transform, we didn't say the Fourier transform and derivative, this is actually easier than a Laplace transform. If you have the Fourier transform of a derivative, that's very easy. You just whip down an i omega, and that's the Fourier transform then of the original function f. And then if you want the Fourier transform of the second derivative, where you need to do it twice, very, very simple compared to the Laplace transform because it's an i omega goes down twice, and that's going to get you a minus omega squared. And then to find a Green's function, you have a differential equation. You replace the dumping function or the source function with the delta function, and then you go through your process of taking Fourier transform and then solve that in the Fourier transform space. Then you go inverse for a transform, and that's where you use complex integrations. So that's where it all comes together, and it's a nice problem to do. Do some problems involving taking a differential equation like our radioactive decay equation with the dumping function and going through the process to see how it all works. So I highly recommend you do that. And then for transfer functions, that would be the... So for class V, let's look at some input voltage and the resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor. Some input voltage over on this side here, and there's R, C, and L. Now your regular way of looking at this from introductory physics is to use Ohm's law for the voltage across the resistor and the capacitor voltage is the charge Q divided by C, the capacitance, and the voltage across the inductor is the inductance di dt, that's the change in the current, and the current is the change in charge like that. Then when we when we want to look at this with a generalization of Ohm's law where V is going to be I times impedance, we see that for the resistor you already have it. We're finished. When you look at the case with the capacitor we saw in class we're going to look at 1 over j omega c where j is a square root of minus 1. See if you look at this thing here you really want here if this is going to be the capacitor say and this is i z for the capacitor you need to take a derivative here and if we look at our oscillating uh, cases, just take Q to be some uh, Q, say, amplitude, and E to the J omega T, then when you take this derivative, you're going to pull down the J omega. So this is going to be J omega back getting the Q again. And if you look at some impedance here, then you could see that with that impedance for the capacitor, we can see we have the voltage C over J Omega Q. And this Q over C now, see how that's flipped? 
So that means I really have one over J omega C. And just remember that you're in good shape. Then it, you could look at this derivation here to help master that. And then for the inductor, if you want some current times the inductor case, well here, the voltage across the inductor is given by the derivative, see, with respect to time like that. So then if we look at this and play a similar game where I is some I naught e to the j, some oscillation going on there, then this is going to be pulling the j omega down and give you back the same thing, I. So if you look at this, and you're looking over here, if this L needs to be put in there somewhere, so let's go ahead and put that L in there. So if you look at this, you're looking at I, and this is the impedance here. Since that's the impedance, that has to be J omega L. And then when you do transfer cases, you're looking at Comparison. Say if you want to go across the capacitor and compare it with voltage in this way, where the voltage across capacitor is simply one, you're looking at whatever J mega C, and then the total one, you would just add these up. And you're working with these impedances. And you could do pretty much any any question there with the transfers. And you can do pretty much any question there with the transfer functions where you want the transmission is you want, you're basically looking at a V out over V in. And if you have a complex number, say A plus B I, this basically telling you to take the A squared plus the B squared, take the square root. So when you get your transmission, it'll be complex and you do that, you're all set. All right, that takes care of V. For class W on the Lagrangian, we want to know the definition of Lagrangian, which is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. We can write that as one half mv squared minus v of x. And your total energy is one half mv squared plus v of x. So you want to know that the Lagrangian has that form. And we also might point out that if you look at the integral of the Lagrangian with t, this is the action, and that will be a minimum for the motion that is taken by the particle in the system. The principle of least action. So that will bring you to Newton's law, F equals MA. And remember that when we wrote down the Lagrangian with the x dot notation, that's the velocity, that to get your acceleration, what you would do is you would, you want, this is to change the momentum with respect to time. So here, if you take the partial of L with respect to the X dot, you get your momentum. And if you take the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to X, you get minus the derivative here, which I'm going to write as a total, not a partial, but a regular derivative since the V is just a function of X. In the usual case, that's what, hap that's what you have. So then here to get the acceleration, you want d dt on 
this and see we're getting the Lagrange equation, the Euler-Lagrange equation here, and this is your force. So you want the force, that's it. This is your F equals MA, and that is called an Euler-Lagrange equation. A fancy form for F equals MA. And then your X, your X and your Y are, there are no homework problems there. So we're, we're essentially finished here. I think we're good because class Z is this, is this review.